Hey everybody, I uh, hope you're doing well today. Um, here's another rendition of uh, Zephyr 101 this week. We're talking about using the device tree, uh, some of the handy macros that you can take advantage of to talk or pull basically devices and GPIOs and whatever else is in your device tree and use it in your C code. So this is the part that's probably hardest to get in Zephyr. This is the part that probably threw me for a loop. It's only taken me a couple years to actually figure it out. And just turn it. Cool, that was running. So what we're gonna do uh, is just run over some of the things that I've discovered that's most helpful, uh, kind of keeping things simple. And uh, maybe a couple of tips in here and there and maybe you'll get something from it. I hope you do. And if you do, or if you don't, if you have questions, you can leave them in the comments below. That's what drives these live sessions, uh, feedback from you in the community. So if you have questions about Zephyr, maybe there's something that's bugging you, you like to learn more about, uh, let me know, that'd be great. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and hit you know, the like button and um, that just shows, that just helps uh, spread the word and uh, keep, keep these live sessions going, so. And um, if you haven't already been subscribed to my mailing list, you can go to jaredwolf.com and it's right there on the main page. I send out an email an hour or 30 minutes beforehand just to kind of remind folks that these live sessions are happening. Typically they're on Tuesday afternoons, Eastern Standard Time, but they do kind of vary depending on my schedule. So, uh, you're, uh, but uh, yeah, feel free to subscribe. You're in good company. So here we go. I'm gonna jump right into the slideshow. And hopefully this uh, this week's feed is a little bit better. Um, I'm literally running nothing else on my computer, so we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> um, but device tree usage. Uh, device tree helps organize the hardware outline of your project. So it's kind of like the skeleton of your project. Kind of understand, like, this is, this is, these are the things you're using, these are the things you're not using. Sometimes you don't even have to touch it, depending on the application. But how do we get there? How do we, and utilize it? So the main macro that uh, Zephyr has changed to, so it used to be an API call, now it's a macro. And it's called device underscore DT get. And this is how you get devices from uh, the uh, device tree. And this all happens at compile time, which is very handy and very useful because often if you, uh, if you have problems, if you've referenced a device wrong, you're gonna get a compilation error versus a runtime error which is even harder to debug because it's like, why is my application halting, faulting, panicking at this particular spot? And only after you like put a bunch of debug messages and things in there, it's like, oh, oops. Uh, some of the important macros that are used are, uh, include the DT alias, the DT path, and the DT node label. So all those are very handy and important in their own way. So we'll, we'll touch on each of them. The device tree uh, GPIO definitions are composed of three parts. So we're gonna start with GPIOs. Uh, this is a great way to start because I'm also gonna to touch on the simplified version of using uh, GPIOs. And uh, you'll see that it makes things a lot easier. When I first started using Zephyr, I noticed it was like, why? I just, I'm so used to just like writing to a port and boom, I got GPIO functionality. Well, in this case, uh, these, these APIs make it a little bit simpler for you to pull in a GPIO and just configure it and start using it uh, versus the other way around where you had to like get the port, you got to get the pin and you got to get the flags all separately and then initialize them separately and it's a mess. So this, this uh, DT, this uh, suffix DT, um, we'll jump into it, but it's very handy for GPIO use. On the uh, device tree side, and, and this isn't an overlay, but uh, you can create, if there's a GPIO definition somewhere, and you start with the port, and then you get to the pin number, and then the flags. I've kind of talked about the idea of a GPIO port in the past. More, more, most important thing is your port name is gonna differ by the type of chip you have, so NRF, you're gonna be using GPIO zero on most parts. If you're using NR52, they have two ports, and I have probably NR53 has the same functionality where there are two ports, GPIO zero and GPIO one. 
Uh, STM32s uh, are letter-based, so GPIO A, B, C, D, blah. Pin number, and then the flags. So the flags is essentially, what, what are you doing with this? Like, what, what's the purpose of this pin? What, what is its kind of default state for this application? So in this case, uh, I want to set it as active high. And uh, typically, this or for this application, it's an output, but I'll show you what you can do for reading it as an input shortly. So using the GPIO is made similar by using the uh, configure DT API. So literally, the, the only difference between using these simplified uh, APIs and then also the, um, the regular API is just that there's a suffix with uh, underscore DT on it. So you're actually referencing the device tree GPIO pin. So we'll, uh, we'll jump into how to use that. But. Uh, it has that DT suffix, and we're going to be using both macros and API calls, um, which uh, which refer directly to this, the GPIO configuration. So there's a GPIO DT spec, and that is basically getting the the pin and the port all at once. And uh, this is a little it's using a more specified version of the device DT get, except it's called GPIO DT spec get. And um, we're using, we're referencing the DT path of Zephyr user. That's the way you can kind of create your own custom pins and ports and devices uh, within Zephyr without having to kind of create your own device binding, which kind of gets hairy. And uh, it's the one note about the GPIO stuff is that uh, using, you, if you want to generate any type of GPIOs, uh, you have to name them a specific way. So Zephyr will look for anything that has GPIOs with an S at the end of it, uh, if you want to specify a GPIO array. All these definitions are specified as arrays, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and most of the time, you're just using one, so but, uh, they are specified as arrays. When you, uh, when you pull it in, so we want to make sure that the port is running OK. Uh, I've never had a problem with this ever, but um, depending on the hardware, maybe your, this would probably more be applicable for, for like a, maybe a GPIO expander or something that's not directly integrated with your your IC. So there's a some initialization happening in the background over at squared C or whatever to make sure it's working okay. And if that fails, this is the way it gets checked before you start trying to use it. Um, for things that are built in, it's integrated into your, into the chip itself you're most likely not going to have problems. So, but that, that check is there just to make sure that uh, you don't run into, uh, you don't make any mistakes trying to write, write to something that doesn't work. Uh, you can see, so we're checking if it's ready. This also checks if that uh, latch underscore n dot port is null. I've seen examples in the past where they actually did a null check plus they're doing some, uh, making sure that the device is actually functional. Um, that API call now does both. So you don't have to check for null here. Uh, we're, duh, 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 we're gonna, one thing, so we're running that uh, GPIO pin configured uh, underscore DT. Now what this will do is it'll configure whatever you want it to be. So we're gonna configure it as an output active, whatever. But what's important here is this, this, this call will merge the flags in the device tree plus whatever you provide there. So if you say, I want it to be configured as an output, or maybe th this is even a better example because I ran into this, but if you configure it, say, I want to configure this as, um, as a disconnected, but in the overlay, you actually set it up as an output. The output is going to override the disconnected. So you got to be careful with using this specific API. You can also do the configure where you're not doing the underscore DT. You're just doing the configure the manual way where you set the port and the pin and also the flags. That's the way I found for power savings and things like that. I actually have to use that API uh, to use it outside of its normal uh, configuration or how it was set up. So that's something to keep in mind. Just like why isn't my pin getting set the correct way? because it's being logic ORed with the other flags that are in the overlay. So you have to just keep that in mind. Very important. 
so in this case, we're setting it to GPIO active, so we're just setting it active, uh, active state is whatever, I think it was active high. Um, and that, that's, that's, that's it for configuring it. Now, if you want to set, you, you can use the GPL pin set DT. This you can either set to zero or one, and this is literally just setting the state. Pretty straightforward. Uh, and if you want to get the state, say you actually configured it as an input, you can use the GPL pin get DT, and this will actually get the state of that pin if it is set as an input. If it's set as an output, uh, depending on your hardware or your uh, the API, the GP, the hardware APIs, they actually might check to see if your output, what the output value is, if it's set as an output, but it depends on the lower level drivers. So I'm not sure what the Zephyr convention is if you're, if you run that GPL pin get, if it's gonna return the, um, if it's an output, if it's gonna return the state or what, so. But keep that in mind, this, that's, this, GP, this uh, API is here for your use to get the state of the pin, especially at, when it's an input. Uh, so GPIO DT calls you make it easier. So you're not doing a lot of manual things. You're import, you're setting in the overlay or your, your DTS files. You're importing it, you make sure it's valid, you configure it as need be, and then you just you use it. And this is a big jump from say, before where there's, it's a little bit more complicated. When I started using Zephyr a while back, I don't think these, uh, the GPIO DT stuff existed yet. So it was a little bit hairier to like set up just a simple GPIO. But now with this stuff, it's, uh, it's very handy. So next on the list. So aliases, um, they are useful for any device type. They're used to help, uh, help to point you in a common kind of system alias or uh, like, We'll, we'll get to it in a second, but there are common system aliases that are used across samples and other things, then aliases just are very useful for getting parts of your board connected to those commonly used aliases. So for instance, LED zero is the default LED uh, for most of the samples in Zephyr, and then switch zero, SW zero is also the default switch. So you can see that in the button sample and in the Blinky sample, respectively. Mm, I see even come some comments about the stream being laggy. Sorry, y'all. It's a little a little rough here. I need to upgrade my connection. Um, so here's what the aliases look like. There, you can see that I'm using for switch zero, just using button zero, and that is just pointing to the definition of the buttons here. And you can see that 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 label, button zero. And then we have a GPO definition, kind of like what we just went over before. And that's pointing to port zero, pin 12. And you can see these flags that it's, you know, we're enabling the pull up and we're, and that GPIO is active low. And that's useful for interrupts or anything like that if you like to configure that in your code. And then inside your code, if you actually want to pull the switch zero device. So we're, we're using the same device DT get, but we're using the GPIO DT specific one for that. So GPIO DT spec get, and then we're using the alias of switch zero. And uh, we're pulling the, um, one important thing is we're pulling that GPIO's entry. So if you look back here, you can see GPIO's and that's like the, that's the array being defined for, the, for this particular button. You have like multiple buttons, you'll have multiple entries, but in this case, it's just one, so. So it, you can use the path uh, macro for other things as well, but maybe say you have multiple devices with the same path name, uh, it might get hairy. So you can use the um, you can use device node labels instead, uh, or device labels, I should say, and um, you can reference that DT path using the um, DT node label and DT label, I believe, in code. So DT node labels are just the ones that are not, th those are already defined inside maybe your processor's uh, specification, uh, which I'll show you in a second. But, but this is the kind of the node label here. We're pulling, this is just I2C, it's defined back in the board and we can pull it using device dt get, and we're using the node label here. 
which is I squared C1. So we can actually pull the device without having to use any drivers at all. And uh, you can see that I was just pulling I squared C1. So, so we just run over here. So as always with the devices, you just, you're checking if it's ready. If it's not, you just want to abort because it would be bad if you started using it and didn't work because you'll run into all types of issues. And then you can see for this example, I'm using the power, uh, the power management uh, API for running and putting it in a different state. So in this case, uh, my board supports putting it into a suspend state, which on the NR uh, on NRF 9160 or any NRF part, it's actually putting, it's uninitializing that uh, peripheral and putting it just uninitializing all the pins, setting them to GPIO or disconnected, disabling I2C peripheral and said, I mean, in this case, the NRF stuff uses the TWIM. Uh, they, they don't use I2C because that would cost money for licensing from Philips. So they just, they call it two wire interface. But uh, you get the idea here where we're actually referencing the Oxford C device. And this comes in very handy for, I find it more useful for turning on and off UART, which can be very power hungry. Um, and it's often used on every board. So you can use it to turn off maybe a console UART or something like that, especially if you want to get to low, pow low power, eh, low power as possible. Try to say that times five times fast. So. Hopefully that gives you an idea of the different ways of using I2C devices, pulling out the devices and, and using them. So this is especially useful for power cases, like you can see here. But quick review, uh, using the device tree is sometimes not so straightforward. We've talked about it. Uh, you know, you, you get simplified access using GPIOs, using the GPIO DT spec get, uh, DT path, macros, you can um, you can reference things using the an alias if you'd like to, especially if you want to use those same defaults, the switch zero, LED zero. There are other defaults in there, but those are the most well known. And then um, getting devices using DT node label, they're all there for your use, so you can pull it in your code and start using it. Especially for the power management functionality in Zephyr, it's very helpful, and especially for peripherals like UART, which suck a lot of juice out of your batteries and you don't want that to happen if uh, if you have a, have a uh, constrained project. So and that's it. Let me see if there's any questions. Um, interesting video filter today from Jim. There's no filter. <laughs> it's actually just the lighting in here. But uh, the camera, uh, the camera is just set up that way and it just looks a little bit different than before. So hopefully uh, it's easier on your eyes. And I'm sorry if it's not, but let me know in the comments. I'd be curious. Um, sepia, nice. Yeah, Shannon, you're talking about the. I don't know. I gotta. I guess I have to change the color configuration or something. But uh, yeah. And then, uh, but our stream laggy for anyone else? Hopefully not. We'll see. It looks like it's jumping in and out of being red. So orange, red, orange, red. Even though the battery is high bit of a mystery of this YouTube streaming stuff. But I appreciate y'all being here. Uh, if you have questions after the stream, feel free to leave them in the comments below. I don't see any questions right now, but I really appreciate y'all being here and um, I'll see you next week. So I don't see any more questions. So have a good week and we'll see you in the next one.